Welcome back to Fixed Income in 15. Today I'm talking to Rick Reader, CIO of Global Fixed Income at BlackRock, and Jan Lepalik, Head of Global Rating Services at S&P Global Ratings. Today we're going to talk about markets, ESG, crypto, mentors, and also raising children. So a quick reminder that the views of the external guests today are their views alone, and they do not represent the views of S&P Global Ratings. Okay, both, thank you for joining. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. So, Rick, let's kick off with you. Would you be able to share with us what your responsibilities are as CIO of Global Fixed Income at BlackRock and how the decisions BlackRock make can impact global markets? Sure. And uh, thanks for having me again. I, so, so, I mean, I'm, I'm a CIO for Global Fixed Income, and so I oversee uh, it's about $2.7 trillion in, uh, in assets and I'm, I'm the lead portfolio manager on a number of our uh, our flagship mutual funds, like our strategic income opportunities or global allocation fund. Um, and uh, I lead a team that we about 350 people globally. I also chair the firm's uh, investment council. And uh, I also sit on the uh, executive committee subcommittee on, um, on, on investments. So, uh, so keeping me, keeping me busy on a, uh, at, at the firm. Um, you know, how does it impact what we do impact markets? You know, I think what's interesting about, about what we do is, you know, obviously we run some of the largest portfolios in the industry across debt, equity, uh, you know, functionally every structure that uh, is out there from, from debt, to, you know, from senior secured to MES to straight equity and whether it's in CLOs or, or a um, commercial real estate portfolio to, <clears throat> to straight corporate equity. Um, you know, and our portfolios span from triple A to triple C. So, you know, so covering the gamut, uh, which, you know, it's a neat thing because it gives us, you know, obviously a comprehensive view of the financial markets looking across structures, privates, uh, publics, et cetera. We trade our portfolios very actively. So about impact it has on the markets. We, we trade, we trade extremely actively in the marketplace. And we really believe in this thesis that relative value um, can be had in the, in the markets through, you know, using our research or analytics, AI, increasingly AI. And, um, you know, we think there are, you know, anomalies in markets. We think things move out of whack at times. And, you know, we think regime identification, where, where you want to be in markets and then trading actively around it to make sure your, your portfolios are as positioned, positioned as sympathetic to, to the regime we're operating in. So, so anyway, we run big funds and, um, you know, we, we, we tend to trade them to try and get into the right expressions on a, uh, on, I was going to say daily basis, but much more regularly than that. <laughs> Fantastic. So Jan, hello. Uh, kick off your question with ESG. So ESG is now, is firmly established as really a key priority for institutional investors. So as a global head of ratings, what challenges have you faced when integrating ESG into our ratings and what solutions have we formed that would service this ESG appetite of investors? Yeah, Joe, as you just said, investors' appetite for ESG has been insatiable over the past couple of years, really. Um, and I can really say that there's not a single meeting between our 1,700 credit analysts globally and their investors where ESG is not one of the topic covered, uh, if not the main one in many cases. And all investors' questions revolve around the extent to which ESG risks have impacted credit ratings. Equally importantly, they also want to know why those risks in certain cases did not have an impact at all. So in this context, I'm really delighted to report that we've published more than 6,000 ESG credit indicators on corporates, banks, insurers, US states and territories and covered bond transactions to do exactly that. There's actually a lot more to come in the next few weeks, especially in structured finance. And this, this exercise has been for us an incredible opportunity to improve the transparency of our ratings and develop at the same time our analytical talent. This was made possible by literally everyone 
but critically through our team of 60 sustainable finance analysts. Those sustainable finance analysts act as a real center of excellence for our entire analytical organizations because they deliver all the training and provide you know, opportunities to learn on the job to, for credit analysts. And that is exactly what is required uh, from, for, for us to reach that, that level of transparency and granularity in ESG and credit ratings. Great. And Rick, BlackRock seems to be putting sustainable investing at the core of their investment approach. So would you be able to talk a little bit about how you factor sustainability into your investing and why it's so critically important to the firm? Yeah, I mean, I, and I think I think Jan described it well. Listen, the world is changing so quickly and, and, our, and our customers, our clients are moving very much towards portfolios that have a sustainability preference to them. And, you know, quite frankly, I mean, you talk about something that is durable. It's the younger generation cares very deeply about sustainability and, and businesses that are, are keen, obviously, to keep up with that. You know, I think companies and CEOs are now having to take a, a stance on social and environmental issues. And, and, I, and, they're, and you see it play out in things like uh, customer loyalty, employee retention. You know, our, our CEO, Larry Fink, talks about this all the time. Companies need to have a purpose to survive. And quite frankly, it's, it's satisfying to see companies adapt to that in, in many different ways. You know, and you're seeing, you know, by the way, you know, regulation or governmental incentives to continue to promote the, this direction. You know, SEC just announced a proposal for emissions disclosure requirements for companies. So, you know, it's great seeing, you know, this is the direction that rightly so, the, um, you know, the, the regulation that government and, and incentives are moving towards. You know, by the way, I, I think this is, it's a pretty huge opportunity in the investment world, you know, much like in the 2000s, where you saw this ch significant change in movement to software. Um, you know, some of the things we're seeing in SG, this you know, low, low carbon technology across renewable energy, transportation, how transportation is shifting so dramatically, infrastructure development, things like space exploration. I find it incredibly exciting about how that changes so many things on logistics um, and, and efficiencies. So listen, I, mean, I think our clients are going to continue to press us and rightly so in, a, in this direction. And yes, you know, investment markets go through themes and uh, and cycles and this to me is a big secular cycle that uh, that is that is you know be durable for years to come so you know we are doing and you know obviously we're generate we have to generate return across markets but this is one that we think being at least tuned into and if not directly managing our portfolios relative to to the disposition of where companies are going where our client needs are going where consumption in the world is going you know, we think is is uh, is the right way to right way to go. Great. So, Jan, the last time you came on this podcast was actually in November 2020, alongside Michael Milken. So, it's obviously been a very challenging period since then. So, what's your experience been of how our clients and stakeholders have reacted to our rating actions throughout the pandemic? Yeah, you're right, Joe. I mean, 2020 was really the acid test for us as an organization. Uh, it was the first massive shock on the global economy more than a decade after the great financial crisis. So in times of volatility and uncertainty like that, investors expect only one thing. It's clear, frequent and forward-looking communication from credit rating agencies and S&P Global Ratings in particular. In some cases, scenario analysis are even more relevant, including for structured finance transactions. And that's exactly what we did through specific timely research. The key success factor for us was really our ability to mobilize our entire analytical organization at the onset, running daily global meetings involving all asset classes and regions who would update their forecasts and projections with the support of our team of economists. 
Um, typically, some of our most senior analysts would also share observations and trends from their interactions with issuers. I can tell you it was truly a fascinating moment where we'd created an intense feedback loop between our most senior economists and credit ratings analysts and all the teams on the ground who were interacting literally daily with all the rated entities. In parallel, we also ran about 26,000 interactions with investors throughout 2020, which you can imagine was a historical record. And it is really by having that constant dialogue with investors that we were able to communicate clearly and transparently on really the issues that mattered for them. As a result, we really got high marks from all of them on transparency and the relevance of our rating actions. All of this by now is history, and, and we know that our rating actions stood the test of time because they displayed exactly the expected defaults and transition behaviors. And in 2021, as a result, what we did is that we took the opportunity to sharpen our focus on, on emerging risks, where, again, investors expect us to be absolutely crisp on how and whether we factor them in our ratings, exactly like ESG. So those risks are, number one, climate change, number two, cyber, and number three, the whole world of crypto and decentralized finance, blockchain. And I'm really proud of the high quality research that our analysts have produced on all these topics over the past few months. Fantastic. And Rick, there are plenty of talking points currently in the market interest rates, inflation, potential stagflation, central bank intervention. How do investors successfully navigate this kind of environment? So, uh, you know, we talk about the number of cross currents. There are as large a set of cross currents as I've seen in a really long time. That being said, I've been doing this for 35 years. I'm pretty amazed at how markets can only do one thing at a time. They're uh, may, maybe two to three tangentially, but basically everything comes, you know, you know, markets tend to move on one thing at a time. And, you know, it used to be, you know, when China trade was going on, it was the payroll report and how important employment was from month to month or Ukraine. Listen, I think now if you were to separate, I mean, every client meeting and every discussion tends to be centered around inflation and, um, you know, client meetings over the last few weeks. Boy, it's just we start with inflation. The second question is inflation. The third is how to work through inflation, and um, and then and then we go from there. By the way, it was pretty ironic. Uh, as John talked about, I mean, it was crypto was the number one two question for a while, and it's still an important discussion. But inflation in the near term has certainly taken on the uh, taken on the mantle of uh, of the big of the mo the greatest focus, and and it's quite frankly the greatest driver of market. So sorry. So what do you do with that? Listen, we, we've gotten a recent CPI report that's year-on-year -year CPI of 8.5%. That is a staggering number. And you think about that, that number relative to we couldn't create 2% for a decade. And now you're talking about 85 and, and And by the way, it's going to be sticky for the next few months. So it'll come down. I think we're probably peaking, but it's going to But it'll stay. But certainly for the next couple of months, you can see numbers in and around this 8% year-on-year. So listen, I have a strong view that high prices is the cure for high prices. And you're seeing that play through in terms of uh, demand and certainly in housing, certainly in, uh, in retailing, you're seeing inventories build, you see the consumer sentiment numbers that are falling off dramatically uh, to some of the lowest levels literally in history for things like houses, cars, durables, et cetera. And by, by the way, the small business survey just came, I think it was the lowest level of optimism um, and the greatest change or deterioration optimism, I think, in, in, uh, in history. So pretty dramatic stuff. So in terms of what's happening and how inflation is impacting growth. Listen, I'm going to just spend one minute on stagflation because I don't, I don't think the economy, I don't think we're going, it, it implies we're going to a recession. Well, I think we're far from recession. You have an economy where the household is incredibly flush. Um, with savings post the fiscal stimulus has delevered credit card debt. Uh, mortgage debt is way down. Uh, companies are spending tremendous levels on CapEx. So listen, I think we're decelerating. I think global growth is slowing. Um, and so the Fed has this really difficult challenge ahead that you've got a moderating economy with a, um, you know, with inflation that's staying sticky high. So 
you know, it becomes one of the big challenges in terms of our positioning. And, and quite frankly, you know, what it tells you is you've got an, you've got a Fed, you've got an ECB that are going to be aggressive, say emerging market central banks that are being aggressive to deal with near term inflation. So what do you do with that? When you tighten financial conditions, you got to be cautious as an investor. And, uh, you know, there's I think there are a few songs about having patience or uh, or you only use a little bit of patience. And I think this is one of those environments where you take so you you run more cash in your portfolios, you you run, you know, you take some less interest rate risk, you buy higher quality assets, more liquid assets. Be careful about, you know, where you own equity risk or how you own equity risk. And I don't mean just pure uh, corporate equity risk, but how you think about taking subordinated risk when, when you have, you know, tightening financial conditions in, uh, you know, and potentially really quickly. Um, so, so anyway, there's a bit of patience, you know, there's an interesting thing. I'll throw out one other you know, nuanced dynamic with regard to, uh, to, to, to investing in and around that market. Oftentimes, you know, when you, when you're trying to exhibit patience and holding less cash assets, there's some interesting things you can do in the volatility markets where, you know, people are trying to buy insurance to protect their portfolio. You know, there is, if you keep your position moderate, you could actually sell vol- volatility in, you know, whether that's the equity market, in, uh, in options, um, and in, in, in interest rate exposure to sell volatility where people are buying, you know, incredible amounts of protection at very expensive prices. And as long as you're running a moderate interest rate position, you can be functionally an insurance provider, you know, particularly if you're willing to add interest rate exposure or add risk at significantly lower levels where you would functionally cover your your short. So so a really nuanced market in what is a very, very unusual set of economic conditions of it's pretty rare that you get this sort of inflation, sticky inflation and growth that's slowing. Great. So you actually, you both touched on it um, in those answers. So now I'm going to give you a question each on crypto. So Jan, I'll start with you. S&P Global Ratings, we're digging deeper into the topic of digital currencies. So what are a few of the key areas investors should kind of keep an eye out for in the world of digital and cryptocurrency? So I tend to think about those risks in terms of, of, of in terms of concentric circles. So to start with, you've got the exposure of, of, of rated some of our rated issuers to crypto investments on their balance sheets. And, and on that, we published um, early last year an FAQ. We, we haven't reported any significant exposure for now. But again, this is based on our own ratings universe. So there may be some some unrated um, entities out there who've got some significant exposure on their balance sheet that could create um, so that could create some significant credit risk ultimately. Um, secondly, uh, we were delighted to uh, rate our very first crypto exchange in 2021 that was Coinbase. Um, and certainly for our teams, that was, you know, quite, um, quite interesting and a great learning, um, you know, experience to be looking at our very first crypto exchange or, or a player of that type. And lastly, um, in, in September, we came up with a very comprehensive research that tried to map out the entire blockchain, uh, crypto and decentralized finance ecosystem. Uh, why did we do that? Because we believe crypto decentralized finance will change finance as we know it. Um, we constantly, you know, quote the fact that the adoption rate of crypto is 10 times as fast as the internet in the 1990s. Um, and as a result of all that work, we, we actually very recently appointed Chuck Mounts as our chief DeFi officer. Chuck works in our strategy group and he's there to make sure that we continue to, uh, to cater to investors' needs in the crypto space, understand where disruption may come from, both for the industries we rate and also for our own business model as a credit rating agency. But my only recommendation in that space would be to, you know, really monitor and and watch that very space carefully because disruption for some industries is literally around the corner. Very interesting. So, Rick, what is your view on digital assets as an asset class and how should or could investors think about how to incorporate cryptocurrencies into their portfolios? So, I mean, you know, I think 
people talk tend to talk about um, you know Bitcoin quite a bit in, in uh, you know as, as as the one place as an investment tool. I mean, the market capitalization of crypto assets we think is about two trillion dollars, and it's across uh, more than ten thousand different assets. Um, you know, Bitcoin is still we think it's about forty five percent of the market share, but boy, there, there's a whole series of different investments in and around. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about you know what is. And how do we think about crypto generally as a uh, and digital assets, particularly as a, as investment tools? One is store of value. How do they fit your portfolio as a store of value? I mean, for years, gold was arguably the exclusive domain of store of value, and you know that wasn't an interest rate product, etc. And so, you know, like gold, Bitcoin has has a fixed supply generally, and it's given certainly the rise to this idea that Bitcoin and or Ethereum and others are functionally digital gold. So that so the store of value is uh, within your portfolio. And as an uncorrelated asset relative to that, you know, it's clearly taken on taken on some of that. You know, the idea of, of protocols, blockchain applications run on underlying protocols is something that is going to be something, you know, we think um, is going to be significant and will continue to be significant. And, you know, quite frankly, one of the one of the areas around these protocols are things like tokens application tokens you know some of these decentralized applications have a token attached with them which powers the application etc so it's an incredibly interesting part of how finance is going to grow when we think about things that are tokenized going forward so it's something that is fascinating and i I think it's a it's an evolution of investing that goes well beyond. Do you think Bitcoin's price is going going up or down? And obviously, stable coins as well um, are something that are really interesting in terms of trend transferability, traceability, global global um, functionality. Um, so you know this concept of tokenization of cash and a transmission of um, of financial assets in a more efficient manner. Um, is, I mean, one of the most fascinating developments I've seen in markets in a, in a very long time. Great. So, yeah, at the time of recording, it's, it's just over two years since the pandemic began. So what kind of lasting impact could such a historic set of events have on the way we engage with clients and also investors? Yeah, I really think that uh, a hybrid engagement style is definitely here to stay. Um, with a combination of virtual and in-person meetings with, you know, on our side with investors and issuers. And while in-person meetings are coming back in the US and Europe, uh, we do see that virtual meetings are still very attractive, especially with investors who still like, you know, the virtual roundtables that we've been, you know, holding for the past two years and even some, some virtual, you know, events like online conferences. Um, so I think it's um, it's a very interesting change, and and something that brings you know from a uh, uh, from a workplace perspective a lot more work life flexibility. Um, at S and P Global, ratings were actually moving back now to a hybrid world, with with uh, employees all having the flexibility to work remotely up to four days a week. Uh, based on their manager's approval. And as a people first company, we believe that uh, that type of work life flexibility is warranted in today's world uh, if we want to keep, you know, an attractive employee value proposition. So, Rick, I've seen that you've developed a decent following on your personal Twitter account. So you're coming up to around 30,000 followers. So pretty decent. So do you create these tweets personally? Do you enjoy using the platform? Or do you just see Twitter as kind of a, another channel of communications to reach reach people? Uh, so it's a great question. I, and, uh, you know, I'm learning quite a bit. By the way, my kids tell me about how many, uh, some of their favorite musicians, what their numbers are. So when I think about 30,000, I think, wow, there is, people aren't that interested in economics or markets. But listen, I, I think it's a fascinating medium by which to communicate, although, you know, I think a lot of what I see, and I follow a lot of people on Twitter, is a lot that's entertainment, a lot of tips of the waves, types of, uh, you know, bursts of information or headlines. And listen, I mean, you know, we build our business on really deep research and regime analysis and security selection analysis and risk management. You know, we and so what we try and do is generally when we do the tweeting, it tends to be in a stream of 
of ideas and that are built out more of establishing a hypothesis for a conclusion. And, you know, we, we do, we do these really intense monthly calls. So once a month, I, uh, that I think has become uh, reasonably followed. Uh, I spend I, once a month, I spend a weekend, literally somewhere between 15, 16 hours to maybe 20 hours on a weekend once a month. And I try and think through, we take a load of data and graphs. And this is where the team works together. You know, what's, you know, what are we looking at in different markets? What are we looking at in the economy? What's driving what? And then we try and assimilate it together into a set of themes and ideas and trying to create a cogent set of views based on deep analysis and research. And then, you know, the team works together around things like Twitter. And as the month goes on, you know, thinking about, gosh, we got to tweak the thesis a little bit because this employment report came out or this geopolitical situation situation developed. So, but it starts at the core of doing deep analysis, taking a step back once a month, and then, and then you know, having a series of, of thoughts and ideas off of that, you know, trying to be less entertainment, less headline, and more of, you know, here's how, you know, here's what the news is and how we maybe should transform our opinion based on, uh, based on the big, big, big picture view. But, um, but anyway, I find it fascinating and I find it uh, uh, both, both being a, uh, you know, a tweeter as well as, uh, as well as following a number of people out there. It's going to be, I, I, and I think, a, a medium that is that I think is durable, you know, particularly to get out short bursts of information. Like I say, I tend to like to read and get deeper into research. So I think you've got to create a, a balance around what A, how you communicate and B, you know, what you take in from uh, from all these all these different points of contact. Great. So Jan, over the course of your career, you've met with lots of CFOs, CEOs, and senior investors like Rick. So which individuals stand out as particularly insightful or impressive? I think with, with great leaders, it's always a combination of two things. So it starts with, you know, this ability to look around corners, uh, be able to think strategically and, and also being able to distill, uh, you know, that thinking into a very compelling uh, mission and, 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 and a mission that, that really, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people can, can, can rally, uh, can rally with. And the second equally important dimension from my perspective is the EQ. The, that, that EQ is fundamental because number one, in, in all those cases, my observation is that that's how true leaders create trust with all stakeholders internally and externally. And, and also the fact that they are relentless on, on making sure that they both empower people while making them accountable on a daily basis. And I think that, you know, great leaders, from my perspective, you know, tick uh, all those all those boxes. And, and, and that always leads, you know, to, to amazing, amazing outcome at the level of their organizations, but also their, their ecosystem uh, with their clients, their suppliers and, and the communities around them. Excellent. So, Rick, I read that your, both your parents were entrepreneurs. So from what I read, tell me if I'm wrong. Your father founded an office products company and your mother operated a chain of chocolate stores. So I was wondering kind of what impact your parents' work ethic had on you when you were growing up. I mean, huge. I mean, I, you know, like you say, my, my, uh, my parents' businesses were, um, you know, were, were intense. And I particularly, when I think about my mom and then my dad joined these chocolate stores, and you think about the intensity of, of the work around, I always thought about, you know, I watched them during like the Christmas season or Valentine's Day. And I mean, it was seven days a week to almost, you know, 19, 20 hours a day. And I, you know, watched this work ethic and, and you know, and I watched and I've learned, quite frankly, I've learned over the years that even though you take, you know, you try and be efficient in your work and you, you use now analytics and artificial intelligence and, uh, you know, all sorts of tools to make you more efficient software, et cetera, get more information quickly. But boy, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I always still find that it requires an amazing amount of hard work. And, you know, I learned from my parents that, you know, they had, I think they had very good business minds. And, um, you know, I learned a lot from them in terms of how businesses work, how to think about, you know, it's helped me to this day to think about, you know, how companies market themselves and, and how they how they operate, how they run their inventory, who runs an efficient business, et cetera. 
So, I mean, I took a ton from, you know, a work ethic and about, you know, this is, you know, we operate in and compete in what are really difficult um, markets and, um, you know, with great competitors. And, and so, you know, I feel like the more you can put towards, uh, towards your craft, I think is what, what you get out of it. And, uh, you know, and, uh, like you say sometimes the hours get intense, particularly over the weekends, but, um, I don't know why it's something like that, you know, I just don't know how, how to do it otherwise, quite frankly. Great. So Jan, which individuals have really positively influenced your career? So that could be old managers, friends, or any mentors. So the way I actually view my career is, is like a big brick wall that I've built and that I keep building with the help of my bosses, my peers, my team members, clients that I meet, um, and, and, you know, people that have, you know, with whom I've, you know, with whom I've crossed paths, um, throughout and, and, and the way I view it is that every single brick has been brought by someone. It's got a slightly different color. Some are yellow. Some, some are really dark. Overall, when you step back and you look at the wall, it's pretty brown and it's got one color, but you realize that it's a very dense color because of, of all those different bricks. And that what is really true for me, I'm fundamentally an extrovert. I take my energy and inspiration from people who surround me. And, and what really what, what keeps me going is what I learn every day from everyone I meet. So that's, that's really the reason why using that analogy of the, of the brick wall that, that I'm such uh, a staunch supporter of diversity, equity and inclusion in general and in the workplace in particular. I, I, my, the way I live my professional life is that we constantly learn from each other. The more diverse we are, the stronger we get as we all grow together and, and, and we share, you know, common sense of purpose. So cannot really give you any names, but I'm struck by the fact that, you know, I can, I can, you know, point to a meeting I had a couple of days ago with a brand new joiner who brought me some very interesting perspective on, on our company, how we operate and gave me some great ideas about, you know, new initiatives we could be taking. Fantastic. So Rick, I read that you have two children now grown up and graduated college. So I'm also a father of two, aged five and nine months. So what kind of parenting advice would you give to help me, help my children, to help me help my children reach their, their full potential, but also to help me stay sane during the process? <laughs> so I, I would say a couple of things. One, I have the easiest kids in the world. I mean, uh, I don't know, I have good kids and uh, it's been easy. Um, I would say, and I would say my wife has been their direct partner in like in, in most things. So it's, it's made it easier, but I, you know, I think there's a few things that, you know, I've tried to establish around my kids and, and, you know, primarily it is culture and it's doing the right things in life, being honest, you treat people the right way and respect other people. And I think that is, that is key and, you know, be polite and helpful and caring, I think is, is, uh, you know, and I think, I think, you know, for some reason, the kids seem to have got it, got it completely right. The, uh, but I, I mean, I have a pretty simple life. I mean, I, you know, I, I think others have a much more complex, maybe more fulsome life. I mean, I really believe in that I have my family and friends, my work, and, uh, and then I enjoy myself through sports and exercise and things. So uh, I have two credos about uh, a life that my kids can recite regularly. One is that one is, and we have signs all around my house for this. One is life is not a dress rehearsal, meaning do it all. I mean, appreciate every day and get as much out of it as possible. And, you know, get on them when they're sleeping away the day. And then uh, anyway, life is not a dress rehearsal. Second is, which uh, also have signs for is work hard, play hard, give back, reboot. And you've talked a little bit about the work hard thing. But I really believe in this, that, you know, you work hard, you play hard, you know, you know, and hang out with friends and family, et cetera. And then, you know, give back to society, which I'm a big, big believer in my programs and uh, anyway, which my kids have gotten really involved with in education, both in uh, Newark, New Jersey, Atlanta, Georgia, and, um, and then reboot, you know, just do it, just do it again. But, you know, life is short. You got a, you got a chance to make an impact. And uh, so anyway, that, that's uh, somehow that's my, my kids have, have developed pretty well uh, relative to some of these things. Excellent. Excellent. So Rick. Last question of the episode, it goes to you. 
So on fixed income and 15, I usually interview leaders, influential individuals from the world of finance. So who would you recommend I ask to be a guest on a future episode of the show? So, uh, it's a, uh, so I've gotten, I mean, one of the greatest honors of my career is I've gotten to become friendly with, learn from the greatest investors in the world, Stan Druckenhoff, David Tepper, Ray Dalio, Paul Tudor Jones, and honored to call them friends and business colleagues, you know, thinking through markets, et cetera. And so, you know, any of those people are phenomenal. And I always, <laughs> when I see that any of them on TV, I turn the sound off on immediately and, uh, and listen to them. But I, you know, it's also, I've gotten a chance to work with any, I'm talking a little bit, so work with some people that have been pretty extraordinary that give me perspective. And the gentleman I work with named Russ Brownback is, uh, is a pretty extraordinary big picture thinker. And oftentimes in markets, you get very laser focused on individual securities or different markets. And, you know, somebody like a Russ Brownback is, um, you know, that we all count on quite a bit is he thinks big picture about, okay, let's put in perspective. What's the Fed doing? What's the money supply doing? And I think being in a, et cetera, geopolitics. And I think being, you know, being an investor, you've got to try and marry the granular, the idiosyncratic with take a step back and don't lose the forest through the trees. And, uh, you know, I've got a chance to work with some, some really great people. And, you know, he's one of those people I would, I would put on a, uh, I would put on a fixed income in 15 before, uh, well, I've worked with a lot of great people, but he's certainly one of them. Excellent. Well, great. Thank you very much, Rick and Yang. And so for everyone watching, everyone listening, see you next time on Fixed Income in 15.